Okay, so I'm Trina Roberts. I'm the Associate Director of the Museum of Natural History at the University of Iowa. And I was one of the project leaders for the development of the Mobile Museum project. Um, we've, some of you probably went through the Mobile Museum on your way in. We've been on the road with this project since April. So we've, we've had 4,000 people and gone 3,500 miles or something like that total so far around the state. And we'll be on the road all summer. This is our first big stop in Des Moines, so we're glad you could join us. Um, what, what we've arranged for you today is to hear f a little bit about each of the major exhibits that are on the Mobile Museum for this spring and summer season. Um, and so, so you're going to get about a 10 minute presentation from people who are involved in developing those exhibits and working with the fossils and artifacts that are in them. And then at the end we'll open it up to questions about either any of the exhibits or about the project as a whole. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing Sarah Horgan, who's the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Museum of Natural History and the, the Chief Curator of the Iowa's Ice Age Giants exhibit. All right, um, well thank you again for coming. And like Trina mentioned, I was one of the curators for the Iowa's Ice Age Giants exhibit in the uh, Mobile Museum as well as a prior incarnation of this exhibit. So I'm going to uh, just go a little bit through, uh, give you a picture of what Iowa looked like at the end of the last Ice Age and some of the animals that were living here and some of the research that's been going on around Iowa uh, having to do with the, re the Ice Age. So this is an, Im an image um, to give you an idea of what was going on in Iowa approximately 14,000 years ago. Now Iowa has gone through many, many ice ages through time and during certain parts of older ice ages, Iowa was completely covered by ice. But during the last ice age, what we call the Wisconsin um, episode, there was a small a uh, lobe of the, um, a glacier from the north reaching into Iowa. It's called the Des Moines lo lobe uh, appropriately because it stopped at present day Des Moines. So not far, far from where we are right now because uh, the state capitol actually sits on the very edge of where that lobe is. And you can actually see the edge of what's called the terminal moraine of that uh, glacier. Uh, the state capitol sits right on that. There's about a foot or two drop off. So next time you go by the capitol, take a look at that. Um, but away from the glacier, you can see uh, various types of vegetation around there and some different types of animals that I'll um, talk about a little more specifically here in a second. But you'll notice there are four stars on there. Uh, one in the lower left of the state, the southwest corner, is a red star for the Tarkio Valley Sloth Site, which I'll mention again in a second. Um, these are four, the four sites highlighted on this map are considered four of the most important Ice Age sites that have been found in Iowa to date. We know there's a lot more yet to be uncovered, unfortunately, because the age of these sites, many of them are deeply buried, as you can imagine. So we have the Tarkio Valley Sloth Site in the southwest part of the state. Um, right at the edge of the glacier, we have the Allied Mammoth Site. I hope all of you have been to the State Historical Museum and have seen their wonderful mammoth exhibit on the Allied Mammoth Discovery. Um, a little bit to the southeast of that, there is a blue star on the Mahaska County Mammoth Site, which I will mention again um, in a, a few slides here, and that's been our most recent project that has been in the news the last few years. And then towards eastern Iowa, um, in Cedar County, not far from where uh, we came this morning with the Mobile Museum, so just east of Iowa City, is the oldest archaeological site in the state called the Rummel's Mosque Archaeological Site. So that's the oldest human inhabited site that we have researched yet to date. So those four sites together um, give us an idea of what was going on in Iowa about 14,000 years ago. So here's a better picture of some of those animals. So we, when we're talking about the Ice Age, we usually focus on what's called the megafauna or the animals that are over 100 pounds. Um, even though there were smaller and medium sized animals roaming around our state at the time. These are the animals that um, have either gone extinct at the end of the last ice age or have moved elsewhere. And so many of us think they're a little more interesting than some of the animals that we still see every day. Um, the mammoth and mastodon, uh, the two types of elephants that were roaming our state during the ice age. Um, up in the upper right is our giant sloth, one of our favorite uh, types of megafauna. 
If you went to the Mobile Museum, on the back of the Mobile Museum is Rusty, um, who is uh, the model that's at our museum in Iowa City that hopefully some of you have seen or you can come visit us again someday. Uh, many people are surprised to see camel on there. There were camels roaming around Iowa during the Ice Age. And if you think about the environments that camels inhabit today, it is the complete opposite of the Ice Age. So they're clearly very adaptable animals. There were uh, giant beavers that were the size of grizzly bears. Um, we had different types of predators, the American lion, the dire wolf, um, the saber-toothed cat, which is not on here. We know they were roaming around Iowa during the Ice Age, but their remains have not been found in our state yet. They've been found in um, Missouri, Minnesota, Nebraska, all around us, so we know they were here, just we need somebody to, to find some of those bones. And then some animals like the caribou and musk oxen uh, that lived in Iowa during the Ice Age and aren't present here today, they're thought of as Arctic animals because they moved north uh, as the climate warmed up here in Iowa. So this is an image taken from uh, National Geographic, an artist's illustration of what this part of the world may have looked like at the end of the last Ice Age, and probably not quite how you picture the Ice Age based on discovery documentaries and things where you usually you just see blizzard and snow and ice everywhere, hence the name Ice Age. Now if you were living on the edge of a glacier, the ice sheets that were covering parts of the world during that time, um, Yes, it would be like that, but f away from the glacier, you would have this very diverse group of um, animals roaming around. Now you can look off in the distance up at the top of the image, have the glacier, uh, the water melting off of it, and then, like I said, very diverse range of animals that are roaming around in this, um, in this ecosystem. But approximately 10,000 years ago, we lost about 35 types of mostly the large animals and some also some large birds. And this is one thing that scientists still today are, are doing research on. Uh, we know that climate change played a role in that, but there may have been other, um, other causes or things that contributed to this mass extinction at the end of the last ice age about 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, possibly disease from other types of animals moving into the area. Uh, we do know that humans were coming into this part of the world. Sometimes they get almost all of the blame for hunting these large animals to extinction. Most scientists like myself don't believe they are um, the only cause, but maybe we're kind of the nail in the coffin to a lot of these species that were already under stress. Um, in Iowa, people have been finding bones of these large extinct animals for many, many years. So this is an early image from the Calvin Collection showing some uh, Pleistocene or Ice Age bones, that mo many of which ended up in the Paleontology Repository at the University of Iowa. And um, so you can see fragments of tusks and teeth and jaws, um, mammoth and mastodon and other things in there. So people have been finding these bones all over our state for a long time. And uh, in the last few years, the last decade or two, I guess, we've had a few uh, relatively important discoveries, so two of which I already quickly mentioned, but the Tarkio Valley Sloth Site down in uh, Page County in southwest Iowa. Um, and these two discoveries I'm going to mention are uh, sites that the Museum of Natural History has been lucky enough to be uh, heavily involved with. So at the Tarkio Valley Sloth Site, which was discovered by a farmer in 2001, um, he found or the remains of three uh, giant ground sloths from the Ice Age were discovered. And so in the upper right there, there's a larger image of Rusty, our friend that lives at the Museum of Natural History, who's a full-sized model um, of this species. Uh, at, to date, uh, that excavation went on for about six or seven years. We've been done digging at the site for quite a while, but the research is still continuing. And um, to date, it's the most complete giant sloth site ever discovered on the continent, and it's in southwest Iowa. So just a, a chance discovery by a farmer who was paying attention to some very strange bones that were popping out of a creek bank on his land. Uh, the site that we've been working on for the last few years that's been in the news has been the Mahaska County Mammoth site, so I've highlighted Mahaska County down there. And that was also where another very observant farmer noticed some very strange bones eroding out of a creek bank on his farm. Uh, the bone that's right there is the femur of the mammoth, and uh, there is a mammoth femur that's in the Mobile Museum. It is not the one from this site, but that'll give you an idea of the size there. 
It's actually my hand in the photo, so there's your scale. Um, and so over the last few years, we've been working with the landowner and various other partners across the state, and more recently, the Mahaska County Conservation Board, who has taken over coordination of the excavation and um, ownership of the bones. Uh, but we have at least three mammoths that have been discovered, possibly four. We're waiting to confirm that based on some of the teeth that have been discovered. Uh, there's been uh, digging at the site the last two summers, and this current summer, uh, digging began last weekend. And so uh, we are still in the midst of excavating at that site and not sure, you know, originally we just thought it was one mammoth. Um, and so now we really don't know what's going to show up there, but that's a very exciting site going on, or excavation going on right now. So you can um, check our website for information on that. And so uh, in the spring of last year, I was fortunate to help curate the exhibit at the Old Capitol Museum entitled I Was Ice Age Giants to feature over 100 years of finding these bones across the state um, from 100 years ago with Samuel Calvin to these more recent discoveries of the Tarkio Valley sloths and the Mahaska County Mammoth. So these are just some photos of, of the different bones. That is the femur down below that was in the exhibit that is in the Mobile Museum right now. Um, but featuring the different animals from the Ice Age, these historic finds. And then when the, we started putting together the exhibit for the Mobile Museum, many of the bones from the original exhibit were a little too fragile to be roaming around Iowa in an RV. So we did have to edit the bones down both for space and um, durability. But we also have a companion website to the original exhibit that we are continuing to maintain that you can find on the Museum of Natural History website if you're interested in looking at the specimens that were featured in the original exhibit, um, learning more about animals from the Ice Age. If you have a question, there's a spot on there where you can fill in your question. It will send me an email, and I'll try and, um, if I don't know the answer, talk to some experts at the university or beyond. Um, so you can check that out and I'm going to turn this over to Elizabeth Reitz who is the Director of Education and Outreach for the Office of the State Archaeologist who helped to curate the exhibit on Glenwood. Um, thanks for stopping by to hear this Hawkeye Lunch and Learn. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Elizabeth, and I started as the Education Outreach Director at the Office of the State Archaeologist last September, coming from Duluth, Minnesota, and Wisconsin before that. So I'm fairly new to Iowa, so this creating this exhibit was, was pretty exciting for me. The archaeology exhibit in the Mobile Museum is about Iowa's ancient agriculturists, the Glenwood culture who lived in an area of western Iowa known as the Luss Hills. Just a little background on the Glenwood culture. Uh, the Glenwood culture is part of what's called the Central Plains tradition or the Nebraska phase and archaeologists definitely like to categor categorize things in phases and cultures. Uh, but what this means is that the Glenwood culture was part of a larger group with similar technologies and traditions known as the Central Plains tradition which as you can see spanned across a lot of Nebraska and Kansas and then just into the very southwest portion of Iowa. The Central Plains tradition started in about the 10th century AD but particularly in Glenwood it, it dates from about 1250 to 1400 AD and most of the sites from the Glenwood culture are located within about 10 miles of the modern town of Glenwood which is how the Glenwood culture got its name. And uh, we don't really know how many, uh, we, so there's 200 known sites, but archaeologists have speculated that there could actually be up to 1,000 sites just near Glenwood alone. Uh, geographically, as I mentioned, this area is the Luss Hills, which uh, is windblown deposited Luss that uh, the sides, the steep sides were carved into uh, ridges, and so uh, the grass stabilized the Luss forming this, this beautiful landscape. I'll just go back to this picture here. And the only comparable landform like this in the world is in China. So here's a little 3D 
image showing the city of Glenwood and the little red dots are the known Earth Lodge sites that archaeologists have currently recorded and you can see that they're all on the, on the tops of these ridges of the Lus Hills. The people of the Glenwood culture, as I mentioned before, they were farmers. They were some of Iowa's first large-scale farmers. They farmed the, what we call the Three Sisters, maize, beans, and squash, and they also had domesticated sunflowers, gores, and tobacco. They subsisted on bison. They hunted a lot of bison, but also deer, elk, birds, and small game. And I'll show you some of the artifacts in a bit. They had really fabulous technology for creating stone tools, beautiful artifacts out of shell and bone, and they had some pretty amazing pottery as well that they used for cooking and storing food. Um, this was a culture that used the bow and arrow. So the bow and arrow was invented roughly around 1000 AD, and it was a, a technology adopted by later cultures. So they weren't using spear points anymore, they were using arrowheads. And the Glenwood culture disappeared from that area from the archaeological record about 1400 AD, possibly because of a combination of the changing climate, environmental and cultural factors, and they likely moved westward and eventually became parts of other tribes. Archaeologists in Iowa have known about the Glenwood culture for a very long time, and some of the first large-scale systematic excavations started happening in the 1930s. Paul Rowe was a, a big... Um, person who, who studied the Glenwood culture, and we actually met some of his, some of his descendants, some of his grandchildren and great-grandchildren when we went to Glenwood and Council Bluffs. And these excavations are still continuing today, so it began in the 1930s. Uh, in the 1950s and 1970s, there were some large excavations as well, so there is a, an extremely rich archaeological record, which is one of the reasons we chose to do this exhibit. Here are some pictures from the 1970s. So these are earth lodges that have been excavated. And you can see circled uh, on the far right side, in pink are storage pits. And so the people lived in earth lodges, and they were more of a rectangular shaped earth lodge versus uh, earth lodges that were more circular in Nebraska and other parts of the plains. And through excavation and archaeology, archaeologists can determine that these earth lodges were supported by four central posts, so those are circled in red. They stored food, uh, dried food and other goods in storage pits in the floor, and uh, you can also count how many wooden support posts would have formed a frame on the outside. And in the exhibit, there is a short video on how earth lodges are constructed. Archaeological work is still happening. This is from a couple years ago. Archaeologists from the OSA did a survey in what's known as the uh, Les Hills Archaeological State Preserve. And um, I'm not sure how many acres this is, but it's a, it's a state designated area, very rich archaeological history there. And I saw that some of you got the pamphlets on the Les Hills Archaeological Interpretive Center proposal. Hopefully that becomes a, a facility and a resource in the future. It would be a fantastic place to visit and learn more about the archaeology of the Les Hills. And archaeologists have also learned about earth lodge construction, so you can see the stratigraphy on the right-hand side. Uh, they can determine that, so they know through ethnography that uh, earth lodges were built by first digging out the floor, so they were semi-subterranean. We can see living surfaces here. Also, when earth lodges were no longer in use or falling down, they were burned, and so you can see where the fire was here and then slope wash, or just natural deposition that covered the earth lodges before the archaeologists found them. I mentioned before that Glen, the Glenwood culture has a very diverse and a, a really beautiful archaeological toolkit, and these photos are from some of the exhibit development where we laid it out before we put them in the case. And here is the hunter's toolkit, so there's a replica, a replica arrow with a replica tip, uh, most of this is authentic, though, so there is there are some tools from flint napping down in the in the bottom corner. So you have your hammer stone and your antlers for reducing the core to the arrows that you see in the center. There is also some scrapers and drills. There's a, a huge ground stone maul which would have been used for smashing. And uh, one of the things on sort of the right side, you see a fish. That fish is made out of clamshell 
and it's next to some fish hooks. This is one of the best things to go see close up. It's one of the only ones known in Iowa, so extremely unique. And then there's a large sandstone abrader from smoothing the shaft of the arrow. Here's a close up of some of the arrowheads from the Glenwood culture. And in the, in the middle of that deer vertebrae is actually the tip of a broken arrow. So this was found during the excavations I believe in the early 1970s when Highway 34 was being reconstructed. There's also a small selection of pottery. Uh, pottery is pretty fragile. Some of these vessels were reconstructed by the Milwaukee Public Museum in the Public Works era, so in the 1930s and 40s. And we chose some small ones, actually. We took this large one out and we just have a broken side of a pot in the museum. And so far, they're, they're holding up really well. There's also a turtle carapace where the, the rib attachments were scraped out and used as a bowl and a mussel shell spoon. There's a, se a selection of groundstone, which groundstone has been used for thousands of years, at least 8,000 years. And the Glenwood people still use groundstone, especially they had to chop down a lot of trees to build their earth lodges. And there's also some groundstone gaming stones. They have fantastic bone and shell jewelry. So this is a selection of some of the things that were found in excavations. Also unique and one of a kind is the, the shell pendant with the turkey head, which is the round pendant there. And then there's canine pendants. Uh, a lot of those triangular pendants are made out of shell. And then there's a bone wrist guard, which was either a bracelet or a wrist guard for somebody shooting a bone arrow. And the decoration on it is Mississippian, so this was an influence from cultures further east around uh, potentially Cahokia or the Mississippi River. The people of Glenwood were also really talented uh, sewers and seamstresses, and a lot of their sewing tools were made out of bone and shell. So here are some uh, long, Needles, some of the needles were used for making matting that, they, that would have covered the floors and walls of the earth lodge. There's also the ulna, or the uh, elbow forearm bone of a bobcat that was sharpened into an awl for puncturing. In the exhibit, I didn't take a picture of it because I would like you to go see it, but we have a, a diorama replica of what, what it might have looked like to actually peer inside of an earth lodge. and. This is based on ethnography, so it's a Mandan earth lodge, it's a Carl Bodmer painting, and much of what we know about earth lodges, we have our archaeological evidence that I've spoken about, but earth lodges were also used well into, um, even as late as the 1950s in North Dakota, so there are people who were living when archaeologists first studied them that they could go to and ask questions, they could say, how did you build this or how did you do this, and it's, it can't be considered an exact comparison to what it might have been like 800 years ago in the Glenwood Earth Lodges, but there are a lot of similarities. We can look at pictures and compare them to excavation maps. We can see what people were doing similarly, and we can also get some insight to things that we could never find in the archaeological record. So we do have that replica diorama and also some pictures of a replica Earth Lodge that's in North Dakota at the Knife River Indian Village. We have a, a case of some agricultural tools as well. It was, uh, the women were actually the farmers in the Glenwood culture, and I mentioned ethnography be below. Uh, that's Buffalo Bird Woman, who was a Hidatsa woman, and she uh, didn't actually garden with scapula hose, but she remembered ancestors and relatives, and she said, this is how we did it, this is what we used. So we know uh, roughly at least how she remembered her ancestors constructing the scapula hoe, and there is a, a bison scapula in the mobile museum, as well as a mussel shell hoe and a bone squash knife. Um, so there's a couple panels on early agriculture in Iowa. Agriculture has been around for about 4,000 years, and people began agriculture in Iowa by sort of domesticating crops that they had been gathering in the wild for a really long time. Chinopodium, also known as goosefoot, which is currently considered a weed, was one of the first crops that they started to domesticate. And archaeologists can tell the difference by examining the seeds. So the size and shape of the seeds lets us know 
what's domesticated and what was wild. There are also some replicas of some of the other tools that they were using, such as a, we have a, a wooden rake. They might have also used rakes made out of antler and fire hardened digging sticks. I mentioned before that uh, food was stored into the floor of the earth lodge. There is a, a replica storage pit if you look below the earth lodge diorama. So they would line it with, with grass and it was bell shaped to sort of prevent moisture from getting in and rotting the food. So they could cover these up and, and go back to their dried caches of food. And then some archeologists in the 1970s are shown there it looks like they have some uh, scapula hose, and so a collection of scapula hose might have also been stored in the floor, sort of like a cupboard. And I also always tell kids in the museum, they didn't have cupboards or pantries, so they hung things from the ceilings in the earth lodge and they store things in the floor. Part of the archeology span exhibit that doesn't have to do with Glenwood is we have a, a case that is arch Iowa's archaeological timeline. And this is our old version of the timeline. The new one is, is very long, and I wouldn't be able to fit it on this screen. But it's new and improved, so we have a great visual of Iowa's archaeological timeline. And then we have artifacts going as far back as the Paleo-Indian period, 13,000 years ago to the present. So you have your artifact timeline and a great visual as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to JC. JC is a recent graduate of the University of Iowa, and he was a longtime educator at the Old Capitol Museum, and currently he's on the, he's on the Mobile Museum staff. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and like she said, my name is JC. I am with the, I was with the Old Capitol Museum as their education assistant. I'm currently with the Mobile Museum. And to kind of wrap up the history of Iowa and what the Mobile Museum was trying to accomplish in this inaugural run, we decided to put in our Cornerstones exhibit, which is the exhibit of the, kind of the foundation of the university. Um, with the uh, Old Capitol building. Now this exhibit focuses solely on the Old Capitol and what it does is it kind of travels the early timeline from the very beginning. So when legislators first moved into Burlington and this was first settled as a territory, they immediately sought to go and build a capital, build a more permanent location. And Iowa City was chosen for that. And so that's how the old capital got started. This project was immense. It was supposed to be the history of, it was supposed to be the centerpiece of Iowa, much like the capital in Des Moines is today. The architect um, in charge of the old capital actually walked off the project. And so it has created a unique history in showing really Iowa's native and like resilience to projects. They had to build it all on their own. He took all of the plans with it. So it really showed from the beginning Iowans kind of resolve. And as my slides keep rolling forward, <laughs> uh, uncontrollable by me, you can see that the Old Capitol Museum quickly turned from just the state legislator. It, um, as soon as the, it was established as a state in 1846, Iowa, it was made very apparent that Iowa City wasn't going to be the capital. They wanted to move it to a more central location. So that's how Des Moines was chosen. And because of that, while the Des Moines Capitol was being built, it housed the, um, the legislator for about 11 years. And that's when, it was don that's when the old Capitol building was donated to the University of Iowa. And so it became its first and its oldest building on campus. The University of Iowa was also the first state university. And with that pioneer kind of spirit, it has been at the forefront of a lot of things. As you can see on the uh, 
the slide up there. It is. It was the first public university to admit women and men on an equal basis. This was something not heard of at that, that time. And then moving forward, it was the first um, university to grant a law degree to a woman. These things were unheard of in in this time. The University of Iowa and Iowa itself was very groundbreaking for doing all of these these things that were almost considered scandalous a little bit. Um, when you really look at how history was then, and even the first uh, law degree to an African American, that was that didn't happen anywhere else. And so Iowa really was a pioneer in that respect. And so going forward, it showed um, the university showed um, kind of the state's the state's motto and wanted to be a beacon. So it actually then housed. Um, and created the Natural History Museum, which was the first natural history museum, the first natural history collection, this side of the Mississippi. So it's history. Iowa is enriched in that, and that's what the Mobile Museum wants to show. Yeah. Um, as we move forward in, in time, it, Iowa has always been considered a strive forward and a university that is kind of ahead of the time is with the law degrees and everything and so they were actually the first state university to recognize a gay student organization and this alliance is still strong today it's one of the um, most recognizable groups on campus and so it really uh, it shows that the spirit that I always had for since its founding, that has continued. And then you know, the university has gone on to win academic merits. It is, the UNES is one of the UNESCO cities of literature, the only one in the United States. Um, it has top ranked programs um, in writing, visual, and performing arts that are known all around the world. And we have the Iowa Writers Workshop which is one of the reasons we became a city of literature because it has had such famous alumni as Flannery O'Connor and Philip Roth and amazing teachers to go with it um, such as Robert Frost and Marilyn Robinson. All of these names have just put a focus on Iowa and really brought it a step above everyone else into the world stage. But we're not just known for the liberal arts and all and those um, things. We're known for science achievements as well. Dr. Van Allen um, was one of the leading researchers of radiation belts around the, uh, the Earth. And so that's why today they're called the Van Allen radiation belts. And that's why we also have such a strong physics department at Iowa. It's, it has helped with many things um, in the Mobile Museum, we have a display on Voyager 1, which Iowa was crucial in helping develop. And that satellite has since left our solar system and is still transmitting data to us today that is invaluable. It's stuff that we could only speculate before, but now we're getting hard evidence from. And it's been, the University of Iowa has from its founding, become a leader in education, constantly ranked in the top 30. Um, as you can see, we have 23 graduate programs ranked among the top 25 of their kind. And so this, uh, this spirit that we want to be the best has um, continued on. We're one of the top 10 colleges for veterans. And so the University of Iowa has this a high performance rating from its hospitals and clinics and this is all stemming from the old capital. It was the center, this is, and that building was where they housed uh, all of the early programs and since then it's grown. And so that's what we wanted to focus on was the achievements that 
Iowans have made and that the University of Iowa has made ever since it's from its founding. And so now, um, with my short presentation concluded, I will open the floor up for questions. Do you guys have any of any of the? We can invite the entire team up here. So there was some fantastic information today from the curators. Yeah, thank you so much. So if you have any questions, they'd be happy to take them right now. Is they're recording us apparently. <laughs> um, the both the Tarkio Valley Sloth site and the Mahaska County Mam site are on private land. Um, they are not easily accessible. Uh, the Tarkio Valley Sloth site we we aren't excavating there anymore. We think we've pretty much found everything there is to find, so it really isn't open to the public. Uh, the Mahaska County uh, Mammoth site. Uh, if you contact the Mahaska County Conservation Board, uh, they are coordinating visits to the site, whether it is uh, for groups that want to volunteer and dig. Um, I didn't mention that, uh, well, actually, both of those projects only came to be because of uh, so many volunteers. We had very little funding for each of those, and so they've been excavated through mostly volunteer efforts. Um, but yes, you can contact the Conservation Board there as over the past winter they took over coordination of the excavation um, and uh, are curating the bones which will eventually go on display in Oskaloosa, so you can email them, yeah. And how about the uh, Lud Plus Hills, is that a possibility? Well, there, there are currently no excavations going on in the Lus Hills. There is a huge project based on the 1970 Highway 34 excavations where those collections were essentially excavated and then put straight into storage. And so researchers from the Office of the State Archaeologist got a, a really great grant to analyze those artifacts. So they're still taking them out of the original field bags from 1969 to 1972. And with that project, we're going to develop an online interactive web gallery of some of the great artifacts and also a booklet for the public. But we're hoping that the Lus Hills Archaeological Interpretive Center does get funding to get off the ground. Uh, and there could be potentially some field work based off of that. Otherwise, if you'd like some information on the Iowa Archaeological Society, they're a statewide group. They do volunteer excavations from time to time. And the public can definitely get involved if you're a member of the Iowa Archaeological Society. Uh, I know that later this year, I'm not sure exactly when, but I can find out there will be a volunteer excavation uh, near the Amana colonies. So I can try to get more information on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's I'm curious about the speed of the actual disappearance of the megafauna. The glacier was there 14,000 years ago. How long did it take the glacier to retreat? And did the megafauna disappear during the retreat or after the retreat? Uh, during the retreat. Um, so the picture we show with uh, the Des Moines lobe reaching down to modern day Des Moines at about 14,000 years ago, that lobe was completely gone from the state by 10,000 years ago. Um, scientists are still debating um, how quickly the extinction of the megafauna happened, but it, most of the recent research points to within 1,000 or 2,000 years, which seems like a long time to us, but in geologic terms that is relatively overnight. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there are several theories. You know, everybody has their idea on why it happened. We know that there was serious climate change going on, um, and we think that was probably the main factor is how these different groups of animals adapted to climate change. Um, and I get asked a lot, why, you know, why should we care about, you know, a mass extinction 10,000 years ago? Well, we're going through pretty serious climate change right now, and a lot of our animals today are reacting in different ways. And so we think this most recent um, mass extinction, you know, 10 to 14,000 years ago, uh, we may have a lot of lessons to learn for the one that we're going through right now. But we do know that Native Americans were coming into North America at that time, uh, hunting these megafauna, but also hunting the smaller and medium-sized animals that survived. 
Uh, different diseases were coming in from other groups migrating into the area, mostly from the south, coming north as it got warmer. So it, I feel like, and uh, many people feel like, it was probably a combination of a lot of things happening at once, and these groups of animals were under stress. Yeah. You noted on your diagram you have a lot of trees. Yes. I was They, um, on the edges of the glaciers where they kind of thinned out, there would have been some vegetation, but uh, directly next to the, the glaciers would have been very much like the tundra up north today. And then as you kind of came away from that, it, the, the climate w or the vegetation wouldn't be all that different really than it is today. Um, Well, <laughs> so um, a lot of scientists say we're actually still in an ice age. We are just in an interglacial period. Um, with the climate change that's happening now because of human causes, um, that's obviously going to change what the planet would have done without our interaction. But um, you want to? Take that one on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, there, we we are in a an interglacial warming period, but there are very long cycles that will eventually cause another ice age. But those tend to be on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. So we're not talking about another ice age, you know, in another 200 years, but maybe in another like 200,000 years. And those cycles have to do with things like um, changes in what the Earth's axis is pointing to. So, so the Earth's axis is currently pointing towards the North Star, Polaris, but it's slowly shifting towards Vega. And things like that are part of this, these massive, long geological cycles um, that affect global climate on a very slow changing scale. Although this last winter may have <laughs> convinced many people that we were in a small glacial period. Yeah. Uh, back to the Mahaska uh, mammoth site. Mm -hmm. Which species are oh, you finding there? I'm glad you asked that because I didn't mention it. Usually people assume all mammoths are woolly mammoths, and that is not the case. Um, most of the mammoths in Iowa would have been Columbian mammoths, which were the larger southern cousins of the woolly mammoths. Um, and that's what we, when we first started finding bones at the site in Mahaska County, we just assumed they were Columbian because it was that far south in Iowa. That's what they should have been. Um, based on the teeth we've been finding, we can tell that um, they are woolly, in fact. Um, and so we've been uh, working with uh, mammoth researchers from the Illinois State Museum and some other uh, regional institutions who are studying distribution of different species of mammoth and they're, they were all shocked to find that at our site we were finding woolies um, and also with the radiocarbon dates coming back at about 14 or 15,000 years ago that's relatively late in the last ice age that even if there were woolies that far south in Iowa we would think they would be down there much earlier um, by that point, the, the climate was getting warm, and so that's one of the big questions, or warm for them. Um, that's one of the questions uh, our researchers are working on, is, is why were they woolies? Kind of my follow-up question would be like, what was the difference uh, ecological niches of each species like? Well, um, for, for the mammoth specifically, it would have been um, temperature mostly because they were eating the same things. Uh, with mastodons, which were a cousin of the mammoths, um, they were able to, to inhabit the same niche as the mammoth because they ate slightly different vegetation. So mammoths were grazers and mostly ate grasses, whereas mastodons were browsers and mostly ate um, thicker woody vegetation, uh, leaves and twigs and brush. Um, so even though they were very closely related, they could live together and not compete with each other. So. Yes? There have been several references regarding funding and limited funding. Can you talk a little bit about both budget and the source of funds for the work that you do in the local museum? <laughs> so, so those are two separate questions. Um, for the for our departments in general, 
we depend on a wide variety of sources of funds, and that might not even be the same between the Office of the State Archaeologist and the, the museums, which are the department that the, the three of us belong to. Um, we at the museums have a combination of a little bit of state funding through the General Education Fund through the university, um, earned income, so income from our gift shops, from event rentals, from a little bit of a couple of education programs that we charge money for, um, and then private donations and the income on what we have in endowments and that kind of thing. So kind of standard for yeah, and, and some grants for special, for special projects. Um, kind of standard for most nonprofits these days to have that, that mix of funding sources. OSI, I think, has a lot of funding through state contracts and some other kinds of contracts well, sometimes. I'll say for our archaeological field work, they do a lot of contracting. For my own education and outreach program, it's about 10 to 15 percent actually comes from the university and the rest where I'm raising so I'm charging fees to go out into the public or we're getting grants or donations mm -hmm. and so my program and, and all of the education and outreach is primarily uh, us finding money to do it but the OSA is a con contracting agency primarily for the Department of Transportation so archaeological field work is done through those contracts and sometimes they do write in a little bit of money for education and outreach. The mobile museum itself for um, for this year that's about to end in fiscal year terms and for next year um, is funded through the Office of the Vice President for Research and Economic Development at the university and is currently funded with patent and licensing revenues, that being one of the sources of funding for OVPR. Um, we'll see what the the future funding is like. This is since this is a new project, we're still figuring out even you know exactly how to run it and how the logistics should work, and even how much it costs to travel around the state of Iowa. Um, so it's so some of it is an open question, but basically we're cobbling together funding sources as we can find them for all these projects and trying to make every dollar stretch as far as we can, like everybody else is. State we will fair. be back. Yeah, we will be back for the state fair. Um, we will be all throughout Iowa. Um, we do. We're doing Rag Bry. We're doing um, events all across the state. So Rag Bry is our first big one coming up end of July. Then the state fair. Then the Clay County Fair. Those are the three, really the big three. But then, yeah, we will be everywhere and kind of anywhere. We'll be in Ankeny on July first. Yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, right. Public library. Right now we're taking, we're basically setting up mobile museum events as requests come in. Um, you can email us, you can send a request through the, the website which is emblazoned on the, the side of the vehicle. Um, you can visit any of our, the department websites or look us up online. Um, but we're, we're just trying to, to get to as many places as we can because we're kind of excited about the project and we want people to see it. Other questions? Yeah. You mentioned Glacier class went ended over to the Capitol, and there's a two-foot drop-off or something. It's about like a foot or so, I guess. Where, on what side? Um, it's, if you're looking straight at the Capitol, it's on the lawn out front. Oh, okay. And it's so, so the, the lawn side comes side down, and there's, it's, if you didn't know what it was, you might not notice it. That's, that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I didn't know the first time I saw it until working with some other researchers and they said you can actually see the edge of this glacier right in front of the state capitol. So, yeah. Something on foot. Um, you know, with students these days, oh. it's uh, a mix. The old capital, and the protests in the Vietnam War were very, they're a key part in our history as well. Yeah, we got out of taking Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, nothing like that has happened. I still had to take finals this last semester. <laughs> but it's very much, it's turned into the cultural center of the campus. We house a lot of programs um, that are student involved and student run. We house the Piano Sundays program is just one for example. Um, one Sunday a month we have the music department come in and one professor will play but then her entire studio 
of students will play as well. And so it's very much turned into an outlet for events for students, for groups, um, to house receptions. And so it, that's kind of what it's become today is a center point, not for protests anymore, but for community and groups. We also do, as Sarah reminded me to explain, we do changing exhibits, which is something very new. And that highlights the research throughout the, um, throughout the campus and different kind of ideas that have come up. These exhibits are, these changing exhibit spaces are as of the 2001 fire. And so we really rededicated a large amount of space to be able to house student projects and professor and faculty projects and that we can rotate and constantly keep fresh as well. Rest assured there's, there's still plenty of activism going on. Um, <laughs> at, at least in the, in the two and a half years that I've been at the university, I feel like there's often a protest or something like that going on, but they tend to be on the sidewalks on the Pentecrest rather than like on the steps of Old Cap. I don't really know why that is, but they're still there. Yeah. You still have Cap rallies on the west side? Yep. Um, every, every year for incoming freshmen, we have the convocation, and that's held on the west side, um, right on the lawn, and it's kind of the big, the big pep rally there. And then we have, of course, homecoming and all of those as well. It seemed prior to the fire in 2001 that the building was almost never used for anything. Um, and it wasn't locked, but it was just kind of an historical site that you walked in. So what you're saying now is it's regularly booked for different events that are important to the life of the university. Mm -hmm. In 2001, the fire, as much as we don't want to say it was a good thing, it was a good thing. It gave us the ability to reshape the old capital and restore it back um, to its original, to look more original and more original parts, but then to create the space for all of these programs and revitalize it in the eyes of the campus again. I'll just say that I was a student um, of the university from 98 to 2002, and I didn't know you could go inside. Um, I often sat on the steps and did my homework. I was an anthropology student, so I was in McBride most of the time, but wanted to get outside. And um, I was walking to class when the, the dome was on fire and sat down and just watched it. And then it wasn't until after the fire I knew it was even a museum. So I think for visibility, like you said, it was not a mm -hmm. good thing, but many good things came out of it. Any other questions? Any final questions? We really appreciate you coming out today. Our next Hawkeye Lunch and Learn is July 22nd with Sean O'Hara from the Museum of Art. He'll be talking about the two years in the most Iowa famous painting, which is the Pollock. So we hope you can join us. And if you haven't checked out the museum, please go down there. Um, they also mentioned they're available to come to your hometown to do events. So please reach out. We'd love to continue to work with you all. Thanks so much. Thank you guys. Thank you.